presents a new upcoming class. Stay tuned. Sacred Bonds by Daryl Abdullah Kirk. Yes, Sacred Bonds, navigating the depths of Muslim atrimony and the family. You don't want to miss this one. Please stay tuned. Streaming on all major platforms right here on SunnahFollowers.net. First of all, I want to let everybody know, normally this is the class uh, that Dr. Ibrahim Dramali teaches, but Dramali is away at a conference, an Islamic con conference. So I'm going to be substituting today with my class on the sacred bonds of marriage. Uh, this class is based on the book written by one of my students, Brother Daryl Abdullah Kirk. Let me put the book here, Sacred Bonds. You can get it at Amazon. Um, Daryl. I don't know how to spell Daryl. It don't matter. Abdullah Kirk. Just, you'll figure it. <laughs> and you can get it at Amazon. It's um, This book is only $13. It's not that expensive. So you want to head over to uh, Amazon and get a copy of this book. Uh, this is a book that I highly recommend that every Muslim who is thinking about marriage before you even get married, you need to get a hold of this book and read it. Because before we embark upon an action as Muslims, we need to educate ourselves of that action and know how to do it correctly. A lot of us are have invalid marriages. Why? Because we were not married uh, uh, by the laws of Islam, meaning the conditions. You know, there in order for a marriage to be valid, there has to be a guardian, a Muslim wali for the woman. Also, there has to be a dowry, and we talked about both of those. Also, there should be um, an announcement: the marriage, the wedding, should be announced. That doesn't mean that he has to go and announce it to his other wives and don't get it twisted because I got a lot of the polygamy sisters here. And in fact, one of you just sent me a message and I answer this question all the time. You know, your husband does not have to go and share knowledge with his other wives that he married you. Why do you want him to even do that? Do you know what a fit in that is? The jealousy of women, you know? As long as the wedding has been announced uh, to some somewhere, okay, at either at the mosque or uh, your relatives and, and and his friends or whatnot, no, that's all that matters. That's not a secret marriage. We don't understand what a secret marriage is. Like I told you guys before, a secret marriage is when you marry and it's not announced to anyone. No one knows. That's haram. That's deception. Okay, but if you sisters think that he's supposed to flaunt you around his other wives and all that, you're crazy. What woman would even want that? Girl, you asking for a lot of trouble, honey. Mm-hmm. It's good and clean. Polygamy's good and clean. As long as you abide by the rules of Allah with it. You know women. Do you think you better than the prophet's wives? You know all the drama that Aisha and Hafsa kept going? Ready Allah who her to them both? Why would you want to put yourself in a situation like that? Girl, you better sit on down somewhere. Get real. Okay? So the wedding, the marriage has to be announced. We discussed that. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to cover pages 85 through um, 90. I think I'll put the PowerPoint up in a minute. We're going to speak about uh, the role of the man. We talked about the rights of the, the role of the woman. Because not only should you know what constitutes a valid marriage in Islam, but you need to know your role as a wife, your role as a man. And as we talked about all the last week when we met, the woman, your home is your domain. 
In Islam, women are not the providers. Women are not the protectors. Women are not the maintainers. In Islam, a woman does not have to work. No man can make you go out and get a job. Nobody can make you go out and get a job. In Islam, it's the responsibility of the male relatives to take care of you. For you young girls, you stay home with your parents until you get married. This is a big problem here, especially living in the West. Muslim girls want to be like the Kafir girls. You want to travel. You want to party. You want to move out and get your own apartment. That's not Islam. In Islam, you stay home because your father is responsible for you until you get married. And then when you get married, then you become the responsibility of your husband. So getting your own apartment and all of that stuff, that's not a part of Islam. That's not our way of life. That's not our culture. And that's what we're going to speak about today, how the lines become blurred when it comes to culture. We mix a lot of cultural crap into our way of life. Remember, as Muslims, part of that shahada is wala wal bara. We're supposed to distance ourselves distance ourselves from those ideologies and those things and issues that contradict Islam. We're not supposed to blend in and become like the Kafir. We're supposed to be distinct and keep our Muslim identity. So you Muslim girls should be, if you are not married, you should be living at home with your parents until you get married. And before the, I'm talking to the young girls. Now, a woman like me, it's different. I've been married and divorced several times. I'm an independent, self-sufficient woman. If a, a woman works when she has no choice, I didn't have no father, no brothers, no uncles to take care of me, okay? I had to provide for myself. So I had to go out and get a J-O-B, and I was single for 30 years. Oh, yeah, 30 years. Okay, I'm retired now, alhamdulillah. So I done paid my dues. I get a nice retirement check. I can sit on my hocks and, and do lectures like this now without having to worry about, is it time for me to go to work and sneaking on the job doing it like I used to for 36 years, okay? And never got in trouble, I'm doing a lot. But, uh, <laughs> so that's different. But for you young girls, you're not supposed to go out and get your own apartment and travel the world. This crazy stuff that you young girls are doing today, it's just, it's ridiculous. That's not Islam. You can't blend, blend and blur the lines. You have to make a, cho a choice. Either you're going to be a Muslim or you're not. If you're going to be a Muslim, you have to act like one. As we've been discussing in our six o'clock class, whatever is in your heart is going to emanate through your actions. If you truly are a good Muslim girl, you wouldn't be living on your own. You wouldn't be traveling all over the world like Kafir women do. You'd be at home with your parents until you get married. Everybody got that. And then when a girl gets married, as we talked about, she sets the dowry with her guardian. And that dowry doesn't go to the guardian, it goes to you. We don't sell our daughters into, into marriage like a lot of your culture is doing. A lot of you sisters from Africa, you, your, your parents are selling you. They are, they're selling you, and, and this is haram. That's culture. We have to learn how to separate culture from religion. So let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen because that's what our theme is today. How culture stands between the practice of Islam if you are not strong. How culture will cause you to deviate away from your Muslim identity even in regards to marriage. So we have to learn as Muslim women and Muslim men to embrace our Islamic principles, to embrace our Islamic laws over the cultural norms. You shouldn't concern yourself with what the Kafir girls are doing. You should be trying to maintain uh, what, what the female companions did. Your homes are better for you. 
if you only knew. So let's take a look at this, okay? The last time we met, we spoke about the rights of the woman. The woman is supposed to be at home. It's your job to take care of the house and whatever's in there, all the property and the children. It's your job as a Muslim woman to cook. This is another innovation. You got a lot of Muslims telling you that the man is supposed to cook. Who said that? That ain't what Allah said. That ain't what the prophet said either. That's your job to cook the food as a woman, your job to clean the house as a woman, your job to make sure all the bills get paid, the servants get, get paid and all of that. That ain't the husband's job. I don't care what these um, compassionate, uh, progressive uh, imams are telling y'all. It's garbage, okay? And it's the man's job to take care of everything outside of the house. But again, culture, culture, the Western culture, the American culture stands between that and your, your obligations to a law. How often have we encountered people who praise their culture? Okay. How many of us has, have noticed how some cultural exchanges uh, contradict Islamic teachings like that dowry? A lot of my sisters here from Somalia, a lot of my sisters here from Nigeria, from the Congo, from Guinea, you know, they'll tell you how their, their families charge all this dowry and it goes to her father and her uncles. They're basically selling their daughters. This is haram. This is not Islam. We have to learn to separate culture from this religion. So these are some of the challenges that we are faced with today as a nation. Our, our Islamic uh, values are not prioritized. And whenever we deviate away from the Islamic values that Allah set, set in store for us, it always leads to chaos, chaos. And this is why we have a high divorce rate. Just as we Muslims are imitating the Western people, you know, we've taken on their problems too, because that's what happens with imitation. Imitation brings about assimilation and assimilation brings about the same problems that they have. You know, children raised without both parents, marriages that are failed and end up in divorce, broken homes. So again, Islam is not just a, a religion, but it's a way of life. And it gives great guidance on all aspects of life, including marriage. But again, we have to follow the laws and commands of Allah and put them over culture. Okay? Whenever cultural practices con a conflict with our values, and jeopardize the harmony that the home is supposed to uh, 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 maintain, it leads to oppression. This is why we have so many women who are beaten. Just last week, you know, uh, a Muslim man, a Muslim man tried to hire a hit man to kill his wife and his children because his wife was divorcing him. Okay, we're having these type of issues, women being abused, women being forced to work while the men sit up at home. So Islam advocates the equality and fairness in marital relationships. That's why Allah has told men what their rights are and women have their rights too. And all the rights that each gender have complement each other. In fact, Dr. Dramali in his class, he's been teaching us the mutual rights and responsibilities of the spouses. Two weeks ago, he went over the verses in Surah Baqarah. We talked about the science of connectivity. 
using the science of connectivity. Dr. Dramali started with Surat Nisa, then he went to Bakura, then he went to At-Tahrim, and then he went to Nur, you know, establishing the mutual rights and responsibilities of both spouses. And those verses in Bakura emphasize the mutual respect that we're supposed to share and have for each other. And we're going to talk more about that in this book. So before a woman and man get married, this is why it's important to have a good guardian because the Wali is going to sit down with both of you and go over. He should go over what your rights are, what your responsibilities are. And that way you can evaluate marriage and you can uh, 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 look and see that our Islamic beliefs are totally different than the non-Muslim or cultural customs. And we have to make those uh, Muslim uh, uh, values uh, supersede the cultural crap. And again, a lot of marriages, I get a lot of you women, in fact, one of the sisters that was sent to me today, one of her questions that she texts me is about this. And this question came up Friday too in my Q&A. Can my guardian, can my guardian refuse a man from marrying me because we're of a different culture? The answer is yes. Do you know how many marriages end up in divorce because of different cultures? The influence of culture can lead to challenges within the home, within the house. Cultural norms may also require you uh, to seek a husband or seek a wife in a manner that contradicts the guidance of Islam. For example, look how many of you women are finding husbands on dating apps. This is haram. We don't use dating apps in Islam. In Islam, it's not even the woman's job to go around looking for a husband. That's the job of the men in the family. In Islam, if a woman wants to get married, you simply tell your guardians and the men in the family, your brothers, your uncles, your grandfather, your male cousins, they're the ones that go out and look for you a husband. We don't use dating apps. We don't go to no uh, mosque singles night. Oh, yeah. Some of the mosques here in America have a singles night. Can y'all believe that? This is, again, adopting the ways of the Kafir. So cultural practices, you know, will, uh, can cause us to seek husbands and seek wives in manners that contradict Islam, and the marriages end up doomed from the beginning, and we don't even see it. Again, everything we do in Islam, how we use the bathroom, how we eat, how we sleep, and how we get married. You know, there's guidance in that, and we should follow that and choose Allah's guidance over cultural crap, okay? Again, if something contradicts our Islamic culture, we stay away from it. I'm not going to join no date nap. I'm not going to go to some mosque singles night. I'm not going to do that chain dating, uh, fast, what they call it, fast dating crap, where they used to go from table to table talking to men. This is haram. And that's, again, one of the number one reasons why our a lot of our marriages end up in disaster. Okay, so yes, your guardian can refuse a marriage because of culture, because that's a big problem. Okay, uptown girl and a downtown man. Why, why is it that Zainab, may Allah be pleased with her? She was one of the best women and Zay was one of the best men. Both of these were two great companions. Both of them will be in paradise, but they were married together and they hated each other. They couldn't stand each other. The marriage only lasted a year. Why? because she was an uptown girl and he was a downtown man, okay? 
She came from a culture of nobility and wealth. He was an ex-slave. You know, that's a big problem. That's challenging. You want to choose a, a man and a woman that's on your level. So in this chapter, uh, we're going to go into detail about cultural uh, uh, problems that many of us face as Muslims. And I'm going to give another example. For those of us living in America, <laughs> you know, in American culture, your cousin, your first cousin is like a brother to you or like a sister to you. You're like, there's no way I could marry my cousin. Ilky, ilky, ilky. Well, in Islam, it's lawful. It's lawful to marry your first cousin. Okay. By the way, most, most of the prophet's wives were related to him. Most of them were his cousins. They were cousins. Okay. We wouldn't consider that as in our culture. But we can't say it's haram. If somebody does marry their, their cousin, I can't say it's haram. Okay? So, but that's another example. Don't let your culture cause you uh, to think something that Allah made lawful is not good and clean. Remember in Islam, our, our cousins are not even mahrams to us. I may have grew up. Look at Um Salama. Um Salama and, uh, and uh, Khalid bin Walid, they were first cousins. Khalid bin Walid was her spar partner. Um Salama, the wife of the prophet, was a warrior. She was just as gifted with military strategy as Khalid bin Walid was. That's how, that's why the prophet made her his personal advisor. And after he married Um Salama, she attended every battle with him. And she served as his war counselor because she was just as skilled in warfare as Khalid bin Walid. They were first cousins, okay? But even though they were first cousins, Khalid bin Walid could not be alone with her. Because the law says never can a woman and man be alone together who are not mahrams. That when a Khalid bin Walid converted to Islam, the prophet made him the sword of Allah and made him also his war counselor. And the prophet would meet with them both. Whenever there was a battle, the prophet would meet with, her, with Um Salama and Khalid bin Walid both in his tent and get their suggestions on strategy. So, you know, even though it's lawful, uh, uh, your cousin is your blood relative, it's not lawful to be alone with that person because that person is someone that you can marry. So we have to remember to not allow culture to cause us to blur the lines in our relationships with each other, okay? Look at the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Ali was a young boy, the prophet Muhammad took him in his home to help his uncle out to raise him. And Ali was the same age as Fatima, his the prophet's daughter. When they reached the age of puberty, the prophet married them to each other. That's how the, the, they would handle uh, that first cousin thing uh, back in the time of the prophet. You know, they would marry them to each other. Okay? So Ali and Fatima played together as children. But when puberty hit, the prophet married them to each other. And again, the prophet himself married Zainab. Zainab was his cousin. In fact, Zainab was the prophet's first cousin too. Okay? So again, guys, within Islamic tradition, we cannot allow the, the, uh, the cultural uh, uh, habits of the society that we live in uh, impose upon our religion to the point where we violate. We violate Allah's laws. Okay? The prophet said, beware of the in-law. Here in America, 
Once a woman gets married, her brother-in-law is considered family. But he's still not a mahram to you. Your brother-in-law is lawful in marriage for you. So you cannot uh, be alone in the same place with your brother-in-law. Okay? So you don't allow a um, Western culture to say, well, he's my just he's my brother-in-law. So I'm gonna take my hijab off. I'm gonna sit, hang out with him. We're gonna party together. No, we don't do that. This is not Islam. So when it comes to navigating family relationships and marriage, we have to keep the Islamic identity intact when doing that and not fall victim. Uh, to society's norms.